Hello, and welcome back to our study into the book of First John. I'm going to be picking up this week where Daryl left off, and that is going to be in First John chapter three, verses uh, verse ten, and we're going to be going through First John chapter four, verse six. And this week we are going to to see a thematic shift. So we're going to move um, away from the theme of righteousness, which is what we've been in, and and. And that's that being a more broad focus, and we're going to become a little more specific. We're we're going to narrow in on on the theme of love. Um, so we'll get some of the uh, I guess numbers out of the way because I think these are these are kind of cool just to see the way the shift is going to happen and how big it is. Um, so in this first verse, in, in verse ten, we're going to see the last time that the word righteousness is used for this section. Um, it's the first time in this section. It's the last time overall. And we're going to see the use of the word love go up tremendously. So up until this point, we've seen the word love used seven times. It's been used three times as a noun and four times as a verb. Um, from this point on, or at least in this section, we're going to see it used 14 times as a noun and another 21 times as a verb. So quite a big uh, uptick in, in usage. Um and what is the reason for that? The, the reason that, that I see uh, is this is something that is specific. It's specific to believers. Um, it's something that cannot be manifest outside of being a child of God. Um, and it can't be displayed by anyone else. Uh, a love for a brother uh, inherently means that you are the same, that you are bound by something. And that, in this case, it's the, the bond of Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and jump into the scripture. And we're going to start reading in verse 10. Uh, in this, the children of God are manifest. So in this, the children of God are made known, are seen. That'd be another good way of, of, of saying that and the children of the devil. So again, we have our first contrast. We're going to see quite a few of those through this first little section. Uh, Whoever doth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So right there we have a, a, a display of the children of the devil. Uh, does not righteousness, not of God. Uh, does not love his brother, not of God. And by contrast, if, if you were manifesting, if you were doing those things, if um, you were uh, displaying righteousness, you're a child of God. Um, you know, loving your brother, that is displaying the fact that you are a child of God. Verse 11, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So um, he is actually calling back to Jesus um, and saying this, this is the message that, that you have all heard from the very beginning of, uh, of the ministry. Uh, from, from Jesus has been saying all along, love. Love is how we're going to show um, the world who we are. Um, and we see that in um, it back in John, actually. We're going to see that in John 13, uh, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Um, this is given to the uh, uh, to the apostles at the upper room. So this is right after uh, Judas has left. He's been been called out, and he's fled into the streets. So the ones remaining in the, in the room are are the true followers, the believers of of Jesus. Um, so this commandment he gives is specifically to believers that you love one another as he has loved them. Um, and that is brought down to us as well. All right, 
right? So we have that 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 comparison or that contrast. We see that that he has asked them to love one another, love the brethren. So let's con- contrast that to the next verse, and we're going to see not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, of the wicked one of the devil, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he. I love King James, but uh, we're going to translate that a little bit. Why did he slay him? Why did he kill him? Because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. So this is the classic example of brother-to-brother hatred. So this is in in the direct contrast with what we just saw um, in, in John. So th- this illustration, um, he's, it's uh, genuine brotherhood, um, and, and it's who is hating and why is he hating, and that's that's uh, that means a lot to us n- now because um, if you're in a in a situation or a, where you are um, having a disagreement with or a conflict between Christians, this is. This is what we're trying to avoid. That this this concept. Um, so why did Cain hate, um, and why did he kill his brother? Um, it says right here he slew him because, or he killed him because his own works were evil, and his brothers were righteous. So it wasn't just that his own works were evil, and it, that he was called out for his. Um, for his sacrifice that was made of self, um, there was nothing spiritually focused about it. It was spiritually in the wrong, what he had done um, in, in the sacrifice he gave to God. But it wasn't just that that, that that irked him. It was that his brother's was righteous. So that spiritual envy was, was actually the big um, the, the biggest issue there. That was what led... Uh, Cain to kill his brother. So, what? This is the the, the contrast we're we're looking at is the love of Christ versus the hatred of, or the and that leads to murder uh, of the devil. The very next verse, so we, we've got that, that contrast. Then he jumps into the world. He says, he says Marvel not, my, my brethren, if the world hates you. Uh, we know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So what is he? Uh, what is what is John getting at here? Like what is he? What is he trying to pull out? Um, he starts with the hate of the world. He said, "Marvel not if the world hates you." And he's actually referring back um, to another passage or another uh, time that that Jesus spoke, and that's going to be in John fifteen. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So that's what he's he's referring back to here in verse 13. He says, do not marvel, do not be astonished if the world hates you. Um so we're, we've got another contrast going on. We've got the contrast of hate between a brother between brothers versus the hate from the world. One, the brother to brother hate is completely unexpected. That is not something that should be in any Christian's life. Uh, that, that should not be the norm. Um, whereas the, the hate from the world, that should be seen as the norm. That we should be adjusted to that. Sometimes I feel like we we aren't. We're we're so caught up in in, in not um, offending the world or, or 
for offending anyone that we that we miss that we're not supposed to be in in harmony with the world um, because the world is not in harmony with Jesus and if we are living out a life of a, of a child of God if we're manifesting uh, the child of God in us um, then we are going to come into direct conflict with the world So the, re- the, the second half of that, let me get back to my verse here. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. So you can use the word we or you pretty interchangeably there, but... Um, We apostles know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brothers. So he he knows. And so this is uh, the way um, John says he, he knows that he is a child of God. Like this is the proof, I guess, would be the best way of putting this. This is the, the experience or the, um, the display that proves who he is and, and and what he is because we love the brethren so what he's saying is this is not something that he is that would be possible without being without walking in Christ without being a child of God and living as a child of God um, so this is more than just saying than um, declaring that he loves the brethren. This is, um, it's a claim uh, to a certain quality of experience. They're able to recognize that their experience of love, that their, their love for, for the brothers is, is coming directly from being a child of God and not a child of death. Um, or child of the devil. And the next phrase, he that loves not his brother abides in death. So it, it, it's the contrast of walk. Um, if you are walking in life, then you will experience love for the brothers. And if you're experiencing love for the brothers, then, then you're walking in life. Um, there, uh, versus if, if you are not experiencing love for the brothers, if you're experiencing um, envy, hate, um, any ill will towards the brothers, then, then you, that needs to be evaluated because what are you walking in that is causing that? Whosoever hateth his brother, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So, some people when they they've read this have said, "Oh, oh hold on, um, how can how can you say that?" Uh, they, they point back to uh, to David and and say well wasn't date what wasn't King David a, a murderer how does he does he and does he not have eternal life well that the the concept isn't not having eternal life it isn't um, Grasping like that initial hold of an, of eternal life, it's actually abiding, as 
has eternal life abiding in him. That's, that's a very important phrase there, if you read that again. Whosoever has hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding. So if you want to highlight that word, that's very important. So it's not just no murderer has eternal life. It's that it has no, doesn't have eternal life abiding, living in him. Because how can we, how can we hate our, bro- our brother and be walking in eternal life and, have, and, and ha- have, have that be pouring out of us? It's not possible. Hereby perceive we the love of God. Because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. All right. So he goes from the the the, um, the illustration of being a murderer, of of hate leading to murder, like we saw with Cain, um, and now he gets uh, really to more of a real world uh, view of it, and that's around um, around our physical. Um, Abilities, what what we're able to do and how we're able to show love for one another. Uh, this is how we perceive the love of God. So this is how we saw the love of God because He laid down His life for us. And when He says to love as He loved, shouldn't we also lay down our lives for the for our brothers? Um, that was our calling. That was what uh, Jesus was calling us to do back in the Book of John. Um, and not just not only laying down our physical life, um, but also uh, seeing need, um, as the early church was doing, uh, providing for the widows, providing for uh, the poor, providing for the needs of all those around around them. They gathered all their things together and and they supported each other in all things. And that's that's more of the idea around what he's saying here. It's not just, okay, well, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd die for you. That, that, that sounds really great. I'd love to. I, we don't get to see that in, in, in action very often. Um, and when we do, it's a beautiful thing. But the day-to-day is, is just as important of, of an example or of a, a real-life experience of that love. Because if we just say, yeah, I'd, I'd die for you, but then we're not willing to, to part with some thing, some non, non-eternal, uh, worldly thing that would bring life to our brother, then what good is it? Uh, and what good are those words? They're, they're worth nothing. The action is worth so much more. Um, and he gets into that in verse 17. But whoso hath this world's good, so whoever has this the world's items, or the, the world's goods, um, and sees his brother has a need, and shutteth up his bowels and compassion from him. We're going to change this translation just to make this a little easier to read. We'll go over to ESV. But if anyone has the world's goods and he sees his brother in need and yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? And, and that's, that is the question. If we see a need and, and we don't fill that need, then what good is it? What good are we doing for our brother and, and at the same point going back to verse 10 how do we show that we how does being a child of God manifest love for the brother love for the brethren um, in acts of, of righteousness and and that is what that would be um, reaching out your hand and, and helping someone that uh, a need that you see if you're not willing to do that, if you close your heart um, against that brother and sister in Christ, then God's love is not abiding in you. Like in in that moment, you are um, abiding in death. And what good are you, or what good is that 
both to you as uh, the believer to be walking in depth um, and to your brother. And he, he closes out this section with little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So here we've, we've seen uh, examples. We've seen what we should be doing um, with, with love. Like, this has been a, a pretty clear contrast of, of love versus hate, of Cain versus Jesus, um, of the world versus believers um, in the re- relationship between each other. So now we're going to look at, all right, so what is that actually, um, what does love do for the believer? Like what, what does that mean to us if, we're, if we are displaying love? And so verse 19. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. So what what does that love do? That it's the love that he's referring to in the by this. So by that uh, love displayed in, in talking in verse 18, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. So that love that's in deed and in truth, by that when we know that we are of the truth, that we are children of God and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. So what is that really getting into? What does that mean when our heart condemns us? Um, In my view and in the, the view of a couple of the studies I've been looking at, that's talking about um, specifically guilt or um, when we don't feel like we've done enough or our heart is broken over, over something that we're not able to fix. Um, and, and, and we, specifically when we come before God and we say, God, I don't know that I've done enough. I, I'm, I don't know, like I feel guilt I feel remorse over the times I haven't walked in faith I haven't um, been um, loving in deed and in truth where I've, I've just loved in word and I've been all talk um, but those actions that we take reassure our hearts so the actions we can we can call back on that we can reflect back on the times where we have loved in truth Um, we can reassure our hearts whenever we are feeling guilty or feeling condemned or feeling um, worthless really um, of of the times where we have been faithful and and God has been faithful to work through us Um, and at the same time when when our heart does condemn us God knows he's seen all he's not um confused because you're confused he's not um, his, his opinion of us isn't changed because um, of our, our our guilt or our heart's view of us um, his view is 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 so much greater so really the the, the focus there is around um, God knows all things. He, he will, and He takes it all into account. Um, so, don't let that that guilt or your heart overwhelm you. But the more often you are walking, or you're acting out in deed and truth, the more time, the more things you have to call back on, to say, "Yeah, yeah, I did. I, me- I messed up there. I I didn't do what I needed to." But I've done this, like, 
that's not the norm. Here's what I've done. And you can remember and, and be reassured. Uh, and that's a, a beautiful thing. Uh, all right, going on. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, uh, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Uh, this one uh, is probably one of those verses that uh, I'm, I'm sure this one's been taken out of context quite a few times. If our heart does not condemn us. So if our heart does not hold that view, why does it not hold that view? It's because we're, we're walking in truth. Um, and we have confidence before God. How can we have confidence before God? Like, and this is specifically talking um, about prayer in my mind. So this is coming before God, uh, making our requests known before God. Um have you ever prayed and wondered, prayed and, and been um, less than sure of what you were praying or less than sure of, of an answer? Well, he's saying this is, this is how we can come before God with confidence, is if we are walking as a child of God, the more and more we are doing that, the more and more we are in fellowship with him, the less hesitant we have to be, the less hesitant we will be, uh, because, and not because we have suddenly become greater, but because our relationship with him will be stronger and stronger because we are spending more time walking with him. Um, so we can, who do you stand before with more confidence? Somebody that you don't know or don't know well? Um, if I have to ask, um, a stranger for a favor, I, I'm a lot less confident in that or, or somebody I have a bad relationship with or next to no relationship with. I, that's, that's a lot more difficult task to come before and lay out all your fears, all your worries than it is to come before somebody that you know, to come before, um, in my life, my parents, um, my wife, my my siblings. Um, going to them with issues is a lot different than going to um, some guy at work that I've known for a year or two. Um, and it's all about the, the that relationship status. It's, it's knowing that when I come before this person, they hear me, they love me, they know me. Um, and the only way we can really do that is by walking with that, with that person, in this case, walking with God. The more we're in, in sync with him, the more we are um, in his word, the more we are uh, walking with him. And, and we see, I mean, the more we are living out uh, a life of righteousness in his eyes and, uh, and a life of love for one another as he is commanded, the more we're going to, approach him with confidence in everything. Um, and not just that, this is kind of self-fulfilling. He says here, um, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Well, it, when we're asking what he desires, that there's, there's no conflict. We're going to see a lot more um, times that he is going to respond in, in a way that we want because what we want is in sync with what he wants. Does that make sense? So um, the more confident we are before him because we are walking with him, the more often we're going to be asking for things that are already in his will for us and not asking for things that are outside of his will. Um, and so it's, it, that's a, that is a, a growth thing. Like that is a, something that, that doesn't come from, um, being in his will every now and again, or when we happen to stumble into it, 
Um, but it's in, in, in choosing to walk with him and choosing the things that manifest the child of God. Um, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So here we see a, a kind of a wrap-up to the, the first thought here around love um, and around um, the commands he's given us uh, uh, around that. And we see a transition um, to the Spirit. But we're going to kind of take these piece by piece as we go through. So bear with me a minute. So we have the commandment, as we saw in John, um, believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. We, we, we've got that. We, I think we've hit that pretty, pretty well. Um, and that believe there, that is not the one-time faith belief he's talking about. That is believing in, in Jesus and his... And his um, life, his works, his ability, day in and day out. This is a moment-by-moment moment belief. Um, and loving one another. So that he's basically reiterating what it means to walk as a child of God. All right. Um, and this is actually, this next verse in, in 24 is, is pretty cool because it's one of the first times we see... Uh, this um, this phrase used specifically. Whoever keeps his commandments abides uh, abides in God. Okay, we've we've kind of seen that that we're um, that we reside in His will. That we are a child of God whenever we are keeping His commandments. When we're walking in love uh, for the brethren and in um, righteousness of God. And we're doing that. Um, but the second half of that of this is, is, is much cooler. Or, well, they're probably equally cool, but it's the first time we see it, so it's, it's cooler than ever. Um, so it keeps his commandments, abides in God, and God in him. So specifically, this is, this is talking about the indwelt spirit. Um, and this is really one of the first times that John really gets into the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Um, and by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So he's not just talking about the Holy Spirit, but God in us. By this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So the spirit, the Holy Spirit, is actually our, our measure of, of are we abiding in God and is God abiding in us in that moment. So they're, act, they're two separate things. So the Holy Spirit is, the indwelt Holy, Holy Spirit is um, something you, you, you are given or you, you gain at salvation. Um, and that is not something that goes away. That is that is a one-time um, indwelling. Um, but the the other part of this, the abiding in God, and God in Him, it, the the context he gives us really kind of says that hey, this is not a this is not a permanent thing. This is a choice thing. This is a am I walking in Him or not thing, um, and. The, the measure for that is the Holy Spirit. It's really cool. All right, and jumping down to chapter 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Um, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in 
the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was among, was coming, and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So here he gets into uh, really what I would call it. it's, it's discernment. Is is this um, the next item we're, we're we're really looking at? So we're we have the indwelt Holy Spirit, um, we have the Spirit of God, um, or the Spirit from God, or the spirits from the devil is really the Antichrist. Uh, however you want to phrase that, of God, not of God, and and how do we test that? How do we know? The, what is from what is from God what is of God and what is not um, and the really big test here it, that I see is knowing the word you know, what, uh, what John and what the, the church was dealing with at this time was a plethora was tons of uh, false prophets, and I, I think we deal with the same thing now. This is probably a, a, a universal. This is not a one time is worse than others, or uh, back in the day when it was so bad or so good. Um, this is something that's continuous. There being um, prophets, people that stand forward and say, "Listen to me. I've got. I know the way. I know what you should be doing. I know the path to heaven." It's X. It's this way. And um, as a believer, um, well, as a believer, we have the ability to know. We, we can know whether something is, is true or false. Um, and that's something the world doesn't have. And it says down in verse 5, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. So this is going to be popular. This is going to be something that, like, these are going to be things that the world gobbles up. Um, and we, unfortunately, we can fall right into that because uh, while we have been separated, while we are uh, of God and we're, and we're going to have, uh, that does not mean that we can't walk in the flesh, that we can't walk in as a child of darkness, as a child of the devil, um, and be tempted, led astray, um, and in some cases devoured by this um, by this belief, by this false belief. Um, and he, but he's given us a way of of knowing, um, and a way of having confidence in our condition and in what we believe um, and he lays it out for us right here uh, it's going to be a by the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit is, is our is our measuring stick for um, the philosophies or the things that we hear um, and and then here in verse 2 and I'll put it back up on the screen so you guys can see it but in verse 2 by this you know the spirits of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Because that is what we're dealing with. Uh, we know that um, Jesus coming in the flesh, dying on the cross, and paying the price for, for each and every one of us, that is uh, our confidence. That is the one way uh, to stand before a righteous God. Um, 
with no fear, with no worry, with no concern, um, and to stand before him as a child of God is in knowing that, and all the the things that are the other things we hear, the other um, spiritual ways, I guess is the best way I can think to say that. They can't say that. Um, if it does not confess, it does not confess Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, then it's not of God. And some of it sounds really, really good sometimes. Some of it sounds super appealing, and it and it really appeals to uh, to me, to my flesh, to the to the old nature, to the to the child of of uh, of the world that says, well, maybe you could do this. Maybe. Maybe that's not the only way. Maybe that's not um, what it really meant. That's not what really happened. Um, but in having the Holy Spirit and in walking in love and walking in righteousness um, and walking as a child of God and growing more and more confident in what we know, we can declare truth from fiction, we can know truth from fiction, um, and we can see it. We can call it out, um, and we can live in a way that shows the truth. All right. So, just uh, to recap everything from this section, I'm getting to the end here. Um, but this is this um, this section is really all about confidence, confidence in our condition, confidence in not just that I'm saved and I'm going to heaven, but confidence in what I'm doing here and now. I can know uh, that my walk is becoming of who I am, that it is um, in line with what I believe, and it's uh, profitable for eternal life, that it is um, recognized by God as... Uh, as good uh, and um, if you, so if you're ever wondering if you're ever uh, falling into uh, the, the fear of or the, the worry the, the guilt as it kind of went into in, in chapter 3 at the end there um, this is a good section to come back to and remind yourself that we can have confidence in, in, in what we're doing here and now we can know that we are walking with God right now Let's pray as we close today. Father God, thank you for thank you for 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 these verses, Lord. Thank you for this reminder that I can um, that I can stand before you, God, assured of uh, of who I am, always a child of God in position, but also good a child of God in condition that I can stand um, affirmed and and confident and, and uh, without fear or guilt before you Lord that I can come to you knowing that I, that I what I ask will be asked in your will that your will be done I just uh, thank you for that, and I pray that as we as we dive more and more into your truth, that we learn more and more who you are, and that we can walk as a child of God. We can manifest that child of God in our in our day to day lives each and every day. Father God, thank you for thank you for for this morning. Thank you for um, the the chance to to dive into your word and study together, Lord. It's your name we pray. Amen.